Um, <coughs> I'd like to start with a kind of health warning. Um, the chief rabbi this week tried to silence those of us who, in his words, vilify and delegitimize Zionism, accusing us of being, by definition, anti-Semites. Well, I hope he's not here tonight, because if he is, he's in for an uncomfortable time. The ideas we're going to discuss are of their nature, a criticism and a condemnation of Zionism, a political movement that's brought a hundred years of injustice to the rightful inhabitants of what is now Israel. But to suggest that opposition to Zionism and to Israel is anti-Semitism is the last desperate attempt of supporters of Israel to silence their critics. The one state idea is by its nature a vilification and a delegitimization of Zionism which calls for an exclusive and unshared state in Palestine. And indeed, it was interesting to hear how even calling for one state uh, is seen as treason. Um, what do I mean by one democratic state? I think each of us in the movement, if one could call it a movement, probably has subtly different ideas. Um, but I'm going to start <coughs> with, a, with a simple definition which which leaves a lot of questions unanswered and then we can maybe answer them uh, as we go through. For me, it's one democratic state of all its citizens between the Jordan and the Mediterranean in which no race, creed or social group has privileged status and all citizens have equal national and political rights. There are all sorts of things that flow from that, or that could flow from that, or that people might object to, or phrase it in a different way. But I mean, I think roughly that's what we're talking about. One state of all the people who live between those two waterways. Um, it's an idea which, <coughs> uh, as Ramsey as mentioned, I, I favored in my, in my book, uh, Palestine, A Personal History. And at the time, as some of you here will, will remember, it was seen as an outrageous and implausible suggestion <laughs> because obviously um, what was going to happen is that there were going to be two uh, states. There was going to be Israel and there was going to be Palestine in the West Bank and Gaza and there did seem to be a few little obstacles in the way of that but surely nothing that um, some interesting discussion could, uh, could not get over. Well, of course... What we've seen is, is quite the opposite. We've seen, it seems to me, a flourishing of the one state idea and a dwindling away of the, uh, the possibility of two states. And I'd like to read you something which um, I think puts this very well, which was uh, published in February this year. And then I'll, when I've finished, I'll tell you uh, who wrote it. This person said, the peace process is dead. The next U.S. president will have to deal with an Israel determined to permanently occupy, sorry about the split infinitive, that seems not me, all the territory between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, including where 2.5 West Bank Palestinians live. How did we get there? So many people stuck knives into the peace process, it's hard to know who delivered the mortal blow. Was it the fanatical Jewish settlers determined to keep expanding their footprint in the West Bank? unable to sabotage any Israeli politician or army officer who opposed them? Was it right-wing Jewish billionaires like Sheldon Adelson who used their influence to blunt any US congressional criticism of Bibi Netanyahu? Or was it Netanyahu <coughs> whose lust to hold on to his seat of power is only surpassed by his lack of imagination to find a secure way to separate from the Palestinians? This is all good so far. Then the writer goes on to blame Hamas as well. Of course, you can't resist that uh, for, for resisting Israel's uh, stranglehold on Gaza. The writer then finishes, they all killed the two-state solution. Let the one-state era begin. It will involve a steady, low-grade civil war between Palestinians and Israelis and a growing Israeli isolation in Europe and on college campuses that the next US president will have to navigate. That was written by an American journalist called Tom Friedman, who has not been known as a friend to Palestine or the Palestinians. Um, and the fact that even he has seen the writing on the wall and written in his paper about it, I think is, is quite a significant thing, quite a significant statement. 
uh, and indeed that the Israelis are clearly blamed, you know, even by an American Jewish journalist for thwarting any other way towards peace. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use um, a format which uh, was used in a book in the 1960s called Honest to God. And the subtitle of the book was Objections to Christian Belief. <coughs> and the, the book was written in order to promote Christian belief by demolishing one by one the objections that other people raised. And so what I'd like to do is talk today about objections to the one-state solution, and perhaps one by one deal with them, um, or deal with some of them. These are <coughs> the list that I sort of come up with. I think those of us who, who do talk about this topic or talk to other people about it find the kind of things that are on this list are what people say um, before they consider the merits, before they consider the justification, they say, well, what about this and what about that? So I think as a structure for how to explore the implications of the one-state solution, this is what I'm going to use. Now, the first one, uh, and this is almost the most frequent one, I don't know if, if you agree with me, um, almost the first objection which is offered and it's often seen as a kind of so devastating that it's not worth talking about it anymore, is that Israel won't allow it. Well, in thinking you know, how to deal with this objection, um, one word came to mind. I don't know if any of you can read it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the word is tough. You know, when, when does anybody go into a negotiation uh, on the basis or accepting the fact that the other party is not going to allow certain things, in, in this case, the key point. That is not the issue. I think the issue is actually not so much whether Israel today would allow it. Who, whoever takes part in these negotiations will be constrained to take them seriously, will be <coughs> being pressured, or will have come to the realization that there is no other way out but to explore this idea. And I think we've seen enough, enough international <coughs> topics, enough issues on the international scene which seemed incredible uh, until they happened. And I think this is just a reflection uh, of, the, of the difficulty that some people have in believing in the idea. But who would have thought that the Soviet Union could, would collapse? Who would have thought that East Germany would crumble? Who would have thought that South Africa would stop being an apartheid state. In each of those situations, somebody thinking about the supposed change situation, however justified it was, would not be able to imagine how to get there. And I think that's the trouble with the one state idea, is nobody has really, nobody can really understand how to get there, and because they can't understand that, they think it's not worth talking about. But <coughs> my stance is, you start by conceiving an, the best endpoint, <coughs> best in the sense of bringing justice to the Palestinians, justice to those Israelis who live in Israel, um, and all parties have to accept that that is the aim, and then you just have to work through how best to achieve that aim. Um, so the fact that Israel won't allow it or wouldn't allow it, I think the issue is also what do we mean by Israel in that sense? That Israel today is different from Israel 40 years ago and could be different from Israel in 10 or 20 years' time. We're talking about a situation in which the realization, which, which we can see is beginning or has begun, even in Israel itself, uh, the realization that the one state is a possibility may lead to a change in government, it may lead to a change in the views and ideas of voters, it may lead to an acceptance of certain ideas that up to now have seemed to be unacceptable. Um, and which, whatever the Israel it is that takes part in these negotiations, uh, it will clearly have to be a different one from the one that's there at the moment. But that, I don't consider that to be an entirely implausible situation. The second point 
which is often made, is that it would change the Jewish nature of the state. Uh, I find this very interesting because I talked earlier on about anti-Semitism. Um, Israel itself, by insisting on being seen as the Jewish state, is forcing people to discuss its actions in terms of its Jewishness. I mean, they can't have it both ways. They can't both be <coughs> the Jewish state and yet resent it when somehow their actions are being seen as, as, as having a Jewish element. And I think there's an interesting statistic. Uh, I'm, I run a publishing company at the moment, and later in the year, we're publishing a book by an Israeli about the harm that is caused by the religious bodies in Israel having such a grip on government and therefore on social lives of everyone, regardless of whether they're religious or not. And the author pointed out that on El Al flights, 70% of the Jewish passengers do not ask for kosher food. Now, clearly, these are not serious religious Jews. They're citizens of Israel, and they're presumably people for whom their Jewishness is a cultural artifact rather than a deep religious belief. And I think this is borne out by the fact that there are many, more than 50%, maybe as many as 70% Jewish inhabitants of Israel who are secular, but who are in the grip of um, a system of laws which pays homage to the Jewish religion, to Judaism. So the idea that the nature of the state of, might be changed, this new state, because it was no longer Jewish, may not actually be as shocking as you might think, because it might be the sort of thing that's welcomed by many Jews who, who will live in the new state, that they are no longer in the grip of the extreme religious bodies. Many Jews would welcome less emphasis on religion uh, on the Jewish religion in the governance of the state. And maybe what we would be talking about is, if you like, a return to what the Balfour Declaration was claimed <coughs> to mean in public uh, whenever Palestinians protested that, uh, that the British seemed to be promising that the state would become a Jewish state. There are plenty of statesmen who went on record to saying, no, 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 this is not what we mean. Uh, it just means there should be a Jewish national home in Palestine. Well, maybe in this new state, there will be a Jewish national home. Not a, not a, not a separate enclave with privileges that aren't available to the other citizens, but some means by which those Jews who were sincerely religious could live in the state and not feel that they were somehow, that their own religious ideas were neglected or ignored. I've no idea how that would happen. I've no idea really <laughs> how those people who claimed that the Balfour Declaration just meant a national home, I've no idea what they meant either, since we know from their private correspondence that actually what they meant was to take it over. So I don't think changing the Jewish nature <laughs> of the state by making it the state of all its citizens, I don't think that would necessarily be unwelcome even to the Jewish inhabitants of, of this new state, whatever we call it. Actually, whatever we call it, I think is the most contentious point. Uh, I remember Muammar Gaddafi, God bless his soul, well, don't actually, um, <laughs> thought of calling it Isratine, but um, I think that's um, at least the ugliest name one could possibly imagine. Okay, here's another one. Arabs and Jews are historical enemies and will continue to fight each other. It's amazing how the myths, there are many myths about Palestine Israel, usually fostered by Zionists and supporters of Israel. It's amazing how often people who don't, don't know much about it believe that the hostility we now see between Arabs or from Arabs directed at Israelis and the other way around it's amazing how many people believe that somehow goes back hundreds of years and that it's kind of in, the, in their genes, in our genes. Um, when in fact, as I write about in my book and as I'm sure Hawad knows we all, from history, they'll, 
in the early part of the 20th century, before Zionism, political Zionism came into Palestine, Arabs and Jews were not at each other's throats. They were, my family has stories of Jewish friends down the road who babysat for them and who played trick tracks together and smoked the Mahili and, and so on. And uh, it's, it's only what people don't realize is that it was precisely the influx of political Zionism and the fear and then the obvious consequence that the Palestinians were going to lose their state and their freedom and their privileges. That is where the aggression and the hostility has come from. So the Palestinians have suffered at the hands of Israel and one wouldn't blame, in this new state, one wouldn't blame people for feeling aggressive towards those Jews who have been instrumental in their oppression. But my feeling is that <coughs> provided a constitution arose, was created in which neither group or none of the groups, because there's Christians as well as Muslims and Arabs, uh, and Muslims and Jews, but none of the groups, right, none of the groups felt that the other was more privileged, that their rights were fewer and so on. I really don't believe that the hostility that we've seen as a result of Israeli oppression uh, would, would continue in the new state. I think another one, which is sort of related to this, is that two such different peoples could never share the government of such a state. Well, there are shared governments. There are governments around the world in which different groups, religious groups, national groups, linguistic groups, live in the same country and share the government. It's not been an unalloyed success in Belgium, let's say, uh, or in Yugoslavia. Um, Switzerland is perhaps a better example. Uh, but there, have, there are ways, there have been ways in which, with a properly devised constitution, um, Lebanon is another example which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. You could imagine a Palestine, a one-state Israel-Palestine, in which you have alternation of president and prime minister in terms of Arabs and Jews. And I think the point, the point I would make, and this is a general one here, is that if this event were to happen, if an agreement in principle was to be made, there would be such goodwill in the rest of the world to try and make it happen. At the moment, people who support Israel or Palestine are on, clearly on opposite sides of the fence. If there was some possibility that they would come together, that would be sharing government of the state, there would be a huge effort by the United Nations, by different countries around the world, to lend advice, legal advice, constitutional advice, supervision, security advice, and indeed money would come to that later. Um, so the fact, we're not talking, in my view, about a situation in which on day one of the new state, all these people would be left to sort themselves out. I think there would be, it would clearly require a lot of work, a lot of collaboration, a lot of support from the rest of the world. But when you think of the extent to which this problem is a running sore, not just in the Middle East, but in the world, um, the amount of time and energy it takes up, uh, the, the United Nations activities that go on, the lives that are lost. When you think, even to think of the possibility that all this might stop would, would be a great encouragement to the nations of the world to try and help. There will be a lot of goodwill that this state could draw on. The settlements. Well, we've seen how even people who put up a shed and then are told to take it down, how, how they resist uh, the military efforts to, to stop them doing it. But of course, the state we're talking about, in the state we're talking about, every, as I said, everybody living between the Jordan and the Mediterranean would be a citizen, and so the settlers would be citizens as well. We would, they wouldn't be asked to move from their settlements. They would stay in the West Bank if they wanted, 
Of course, all sorts of other things would change about the settlements. They would no longer be fenced with armed guards. There would no longer be special roads which only they could use. And indeed, you may, you might, one might find that some of the settlers just <coughs> didn't want to stay anymore. And I don't think many of the citizens of the new state would be heartbroken if that was what happened. But the fact is, if we take this jump and talk about everybody in this area being equal citizens of the state, nobody would have to move anywhere. They might choose to. But nor could they have the privileged status that they have at the moment. They couldn't have access to a disproportionate amount of water and so on. If a settlement house became vacant, of course, it could be sold or lived in by Arabs or Jews. I mean, there would be the usual sort of housing market with no discrimination of the sort that goes on in Israel and Palestine at the moment. There would be all sorts of, if you like, inconveniences for the settlers who live there. But in principle, they would not have to be dismantled as places for Jews to live. They would just have to be de-securitized, if there is such a word, and made open in the way that Arab villages and towns in the West Bank are. A single state would not be economically viable, people would say, might say. <coughs> well, um, if we go back to the point I made earlier about the outpouring of goodwill, as I think, I think the efforts that would be made to make sure that in terms of aid to help establish this state on a new footing, uh, I, I think the sums we're talking about, they may sound large to us in terms of billions of dollars, but as I'll talk a little bit about later uh, when we come to the refugees, I, do, I don't think these are, it would be unrealistic when you think indeed of what America gives in aid at the moment to Israel for defense purposes, if we're talking about this new state not requiring <coughs> such a huge defense budget, not having a weapons industry, uh, you know, all sorts of things that the aid is spent on at the moment uh, could be diverted, and of course I think there would be more. Aid needed initially, a 10-year plan or whatever, with contributions from around the world, from the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and so on. So I, think, I don't think economic vi viability or unviability is a deal breaker on this. Um, because, as I say, I think there will be such a kind of relief at the fact that some kind of solution that is fair and just is being suggested. It, some people might say it will be replacing an injustice to the Palestinians with an injustice to the Israelis. Um, it depends how you define injustice. I think the Israelis have had a disproportionate amount of benefit from taking over the Palestinians' land, and the Palestinians have had a disproportionate amount of suffering from losing their land. So I think a single state <coughs> would be seen as redressing that balance. Um, and indeed, I'm not sure what sense of injustice a Jewish Israeli would feel in the new state if he still lived, he or she still lived in the same house he lived in, went to the same shops, had the same friends. The fact is, if they actually resented or saw it as unjust that they had to live with or be near to <coughs> Arabs in a way that they hadn't before, then tough, to use my word from earlier, because that's just a reflection of the racism that there is in uh, Israel at the moment. So I don't think somehow I can't think of a way in which, with the right conditions and the right constitution and the right structure, I can't think of a way in which such a state would be unjust to most Jewish Israelis. It could be seen as unjust to those Israelis who wanted to live in a Jewish state. And we do have the issue which is always raised about Israel-Palestine, or about Israel in particular, which is that it is a haven for the Jews. Now, there is obviously and genuinely some kind of psychological benefit to Jews who have no intention of moving to Israel 
and there are plenty of them, most of them, in fact, have no intention, most, most diaspora Jews have no intention of moving to Israel. But I can see there might be a psychological benefit to thinking that they could one day, if necessary, if the world turned against them. Well, when we talk a bit later about the right of return, even that might not be a justifiable fear. But I think that is one, if you like, one obstacle too many. We, we, we can't deprive the Palestinians of rights which they have been out without for 100 years because of a psychological feeling that Jews in the diaspora would like to have. No room for the return of the refugees. This is my last point. Um, and what I might do is uh, talk a little bit about this now and then I can develop it further later. Um, it's interesting that people would say this because Israel itself offers, as we know, a home to all Jews from around the world. Now there are more Jews in the world who could come to Israel than there are Palestinians anyway. Sharon himself said that there was room for 15 million inhabitants in Israel. Uh, and indeed, anybody who has been there, and somebody like Awad who lives there, and I travel there a lot, the idea that this is a crowded country, uh, if you look at the hills, if you look at the valleys, the coastlines, the, there are huge areas in which people could be uh, could could live, um, and the idea somehow that there's room for Jews but not for Palestinians, I think is just uh, is just a nonsense. Um, clearly, there are resource issues to the idea that you would move a lot of new people into areas, but. In terms of density of population, I think Israel is 37th in the world. So there are 36 countries that are more densely populated. Now, okay, some of these are small city-states like Hong Kong, but there are others which do have a perfectly acceptable density of population, which is a lot higher than Israel or Palestine. So I will talk about the right of return for a moment we have time. Well, how are we doing on time? You're at 25 minutes. <coughs> oh well, five minutes is what I need. Um, here's my plan. You heard it here first, possibly last as well, if nobody else likes it. Um, I think there should be an absolute right of return or compensation for up to four and a half million Palestinian refugees in the neighboring countries, West Bank and Gaza, to return to their original home areas if they want to. These are people who were expelled, as my family was, from towns and villages. They're in camps in Lebanon, where they can virtually see over the border where their grandparents used to live, or in Gaza, where they can look across at Ashkelon, or whatever it used to be called. Um, these people should be allowed to return. Um, the cost of a new home, the building cost of a new home in Israel at the moment is about $45,000. So to house 4.5 million Palestinians would take about $90 billion. Um, that is three years worth of pizzas that Americans buy. They buy $27 billion worth of pizzas every year. It is under twice what Bernie Madoff swindled his clients out of. Um, these, these are not huge amounts of money on the global scale. Um, so to deal with that, I think, and of course you have the fact that the likely uptake, even of those who, who had come from what is now Israel, who, uh, of those who wanted to go back, I would say there might be 70%. So you're talking about three million for houses to be built. I think there should be a right of return for all Palestinians outside the Middle East. That's 5.8 million. But, again, this is figures plucked from the air. I think the likely uptake would be about 20%. I mean, this is people like me, people like uh, Lizard, people around who 
made several successful lives away, they probably wouldn't take up the offer of a right to return. But we have something else for them, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, there will be no absolute right of return for any Jew outside Israel. But there's no reason why there shouldn't be limited immigration of economically desirable immigrants or Jews who can trace their families back to pre-1917 Palestine. I don't think there'd be many of those, maybe 250,000. Immigration to Israel at the moment is about 20,000 per annum, so we're not looking at a huge rush there. But um, I think they should nevertheless be conditioned on who was allowed to come back. Then, I think for those diaspora Jews who chose, the Arabs, diaspora Palestinians, who chose not to come back <coughs> to Palestine, I think they should be given a month, a year, in a luxury resort, built especially for that purpose, <laughs> near the home that their grandparents came from, as a chance to get together with other relatives who might be in different parts of the world, to, to get to know their fatherland, motherland, to have a link with it, and then to go home back to their societies. And I think this is, in a way, I mean, if you, you, know, if you meet, some of you may know Palestinians, some of you will be Palestinians, there is a thirst, a craving for knowing about and for reinforcing the link to Palestine, to pre, to pre mandate Palestine, to the towns, the villages from which grandparents came. But it doesn't necessarily translate into a desire to go and live there. And I think this will be a very good way and a cost effective way of, uh, effectively, those people would probably renounce their freedom or, the, the, if you like, renounce the right to go and live in Palestine, but they would know that, let's say, for a fixed period, they and their families could go every year and have a great holiday paid for by the Palestinian Israel government, whatever the state is called. So that's my master plan. I think none of it is totally implausible. Uh, I don't think any of it's going to happen soon. But I think from now on, let's not be seduced by the long list of arguments as to why a single state might be difficult to achieve. The starting point must be, what is the solution that brings the greatest amount of justice and respect for human rights to the situation and undoes past wrongs? I believe that the single democratic state is that solution. And so instead of saying, no, we can't, because of all the objections raised by Zionists and others, we should say with Barack Obama, yes, we can. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm happy to be with you tonight and uh, to be to meet also the first time uh, Carl. We know him, uh, know about him, but I have, this is the first time I meet him. And also it's really, uh, I'm glad to meet you all. And uh, thank you very much for coming to listen and engage in this uh, kind of debate about the idea of one democratic state. Uh, you know, it's good that uh, more and more people are engaged in drawing the guidelines of the one democratic state and the content of the, of the state. And this is what is needed, really. But I should uh, say that uh, we, or the idea itself, the idea, without going into the details, is still a difficult uh, idea to, to, uh, to, to, to uh, introduce it or to disseminate it. I mean, we still have many challenges and difficulties. And, but at the same time, uh, I think that we should push forward and make our best 
to convince more and more people, and especially the Palestinian leadership, that the two-state solution already did. And to continue to adhere to this idea or to this option, not only at, at a waste of time, but it could be, it could be really a catastrophe. Because every day, while the Palestinian leadership is engaged in the negotiations, although the negotiations are suspended now, but the Palestinian Authority is really trying to go back to the negotiations. While this process has been going on for 25 years, almost, the colonial project has become more entrenched in the West Bank and Jerusalem. And today, the colonization is more apparent inside the Green Line. And there is no option other than really being creative and courageous to think in a different way. Some 30 years ago, I started working in English language newspaper, Palestine in Jerusalem, and the British staff asked me to go to uh, interview Meron Benvenisti, who was the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. I didn't know him before. And I went there and interviewed him. And why on the issue, on the, on the, on the what he was holding, that the situation in the West Bank and Gaza, Gaza Strip is irreversible. The colonization or the colonial project in the West Bank is, is irreversible. And Israelis and Palestinians should think in a different way. Of course, he was attacked by the Liberal Party. He was a close to the Liberal Party because this would serve the right, the Israeli right. <coughs> but you know, 30 years now, I watched him talking two years ago and saying the same thing. And what the situation what looks like now, it's really, I mean, no space is left for a Palestinian state. I'm not, we don't have to believe in the one state solution simply because the Israelis overcome or overcame the, the two state solution because they defeated this idea. We, because it, first of all, because it is just and second, because what is going in the ground now, I believe that things or the, 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 are, are going toward the idea of one democratic state of one that people would one day, two, the two peoples would live in one country under one regime. Because the, there are many activities that have been taking place since even in parallel with the Oslo process. For example, late 90s, the return committees emerged. You know, there are many return committees now because they, start the, they, they renewed their activity on their role because they ha real, had realized that the Palestinian Authority was going to compromise the right of the, of the return. And this was towards returning <coughs> to the original project. Second, the BDS, the re-emergence re re of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, Solidarity Movement. And you know, I always say that this is really that the re-emergence of, of the Solidarity Movement. This is a grateful thing, great, great thing, because the Palestinian Authority normalized the relations with Zionism, with occupation, with Israel. And many countries build normal relations with Israel. So it was very difficult for the, Palest for the Palestine 
movement, of solidarity movement, to work in such an atmosphere. But despite that, they have made major achievements. And the BDS is part of this. You know, it's becoming now a strategic threat to the state of Israel, as the Israelis say. Also, the mini intifada that started in Jerusalem a few years ago and developed into other areas. If the Palestinian Authority had not, has not curbed this wave of intifada, I think it would spread into, it would really turn into a real intifada. But despite that, Palestinians continue to rebuild themselves outside the official or the formal political structures, either the Palestinian Authority or even the Palestinian factions. And both have proved to be unable, incompetent, to really to lead the, the current intifada. This is why we have seen a decline in the level of the popular struggle. But this doesn't mean that this is the end. Other things which has been happening inside the Green Line, and this so I'm going to back, to back to the main topic that I'm going to relate to, which is the role of the Palestinians inside Israel in this project, in the Palestinian country. Where do they stand? What, how do they can play a role, a serious role in this struggle, in this project? Who knows about them? The Palestinians inside the Green Line are the segment of the Palestinian people who has been forgotten and neglected. They were never mentioned in the peace accords, in the peace initiatives. The Palestinian Authority never mentioned even their daily rights in the negotiations. And I told Saabi Arikat five years ago, we were in a panel, that you believe that the Palestinians in Israel are a burden, not a strategic asset. You don't mention them at all, even in the negotiations, because the Israelis would accuse you that you are not, you are, they want more lands inside the Green Line, or you are not satisfied with a state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And but recently, I mean, the Palestinians inside the Golan really are going back to the scene. And not only that, but this negligence and uh, ignorance is, has turned into romanticism. What do you mean romanticism? That, romant that the Palestinian authority and other Palestinians have started to look at us as if we are going to liberate Palestine. So from ignorance to giving us a role which we can do. So if, and for those, I think there are people here who don't have a background about the Palestinians in Israel. And I will have to really to go to history. And until today, how things are uh, going with regard to the Palestinians in Israel. Uh, the Palestinians inside the Green Line are the survivors or the, yeah, the survivors of the Nakba. Because the Israelis wanted really to ethnic cleanse all the Palestinians. They wanted a pure <laughs> Jewish state and they didn't like the fact that 150,000 Palestinians remained inside Israel. They thought that this would come a strategic mistake. This is a strategic mistake. But you know, at the time, even Israeli officials thought that they should be driven out as the rest of the Palestinians. But there was no consensus within the Palestinian, with the Israeli leadership because already Israel was recognized by the United Nations as a normal state. And also because I think they didn't have the, the, the tools, they didn't have the trains to put them and drive them out. They put the people on the tracks, you know, like in Lidda and Ramla, at least 50,000 Palestinians on orders from Rabin himself and Mitzhak Rabin 
uh, were when were put on the tracks and thrown out right outside the, uh, the borders. So the Israelis, it took time for them to think how can they cope with the, this small minority. Okay, some thought that this they would not pose a threat to the uh, state, and they adopted the strategy as follows. First, to take over their lands, to destroy their socioeconomic structure, so that they wouldn't become independent minority, they wouldn't politically. The second, to denationalize the Palestinians, I mean to uh, ignore the Palestinian narrative from the teaching curricula. The teaching curricula until today doesn't have that Palestinian narrative. We don't learn about the Palestinian history, only the Jewish and 60% of the of, uh, of history classes is about uh, Zionism and Jews. So they wanted the new generation to be loyal to the state of Israel, to be loyal to the Zionism, to be defamed. And so, and this is continues until today. I mean, this policy, the teaching policy. The, s the third thing is political persecution. And part of this persecution, uh, the, we were placed under a military rule from 48 until 66. And you know Israel only lived six months without a military rule. Over the 68 years, Israel has been without military rule only six months. Because in 1966, they removed the military rule, and after six months, they occupied the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And they transferred the military rule to there. Very few people att pay attention to the fact that the Palestinians inside the Green Law were living under apartheid regime. They were isolated from the rest of the Jewish society. They were isolated from each other. Their freedom, the freedom of movement was restricted. They could not go even to work their lands. And the teaching curriculum was separated. The, teaching, the, 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 the education system was separated from the Jewish uh, uh, system. Uh, and we were under apartheid rule. At this, at this time, the Western countries were praising Israel as the only enlightened democracy in the Middle East. And during this period, 75% of our lands were confiscated. Today, we are left with only 3%. 93% has been confiscated. So, this policy continued until they occupied the West Bank and Gaza Strip. After that, you know, Israel became more confident of itself and the Western continent supported more Israel. They thought that Israel is, is eternal. So far, it can defeat three Arab countries. And so we have to give it an unconditional support. And it, we, uh, after that, uh, it, uh, it allowed some liberal uh, openness for the, for the people in Israel, including the Palestinians. And we were able to move more freely or to act more freely in th at this period. And from, 19, from 1970 uh, until today, the Palestinian society in Israel has really reshaped itself from a defeated and outtrodden minority into a crystallized minority, a national minority we started to behave as a society. You know, in 48, we started from scratch. Our elites were, this, not only the people was, was dispersed. The, I mean, the elites were dispersed, were expelled, and the Palestinians almost remained without leaderships, leaders. The only political party which was allowed to operate the Israeli Communist Party because it uh, allied with the uh, Jewish communists who had fought beside the Zionist movement. They reunited because, you know, in 1943, the, Zionist, the Palestinian Communist Party split into the Palestinians and Jews, and then after 48, they reunited. But, you know, they reunited. It's, 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 it's ironic, I mean, that those who betrayed their Marxist uh, ideas, ideals and fought beside the Zionist movement and the, and the communists, they reunited. Anyway, okay, it was the only party which, uh, which expressed our sentiments to some extent, to some extent, 
But other political parties like Al Ard movement was expelled, was was uh, sorry, was banned, and because there was no possibility for an independent Arab parties. So many Palestinians supported the Communist Party because it's the only outlet to express ourselves. And myself, in the 70s when I was young, I also supported for one, but when I never was a member there. But this is, was natural that Palestinians looked for our outlet to express themselves. So, but after that, many other political organizations emerged. And I will go now because, I, because of the limitation of time to talk about uh, my party. About that, because it, I think it's very important in the history of the Palestinian vision in the last 25 years to know about the role of the political party, of the National Democratic Party, Ballot, how it related to the complex situation inside the Green Line. We think that we created a very complex and creative, innovative idea of how to relate after, especially after Oslo Accords. You know, for many years, the main slogan that prevailed among Palestinians is equality. It was embraced by the Communist Party. But the Communist Party never specified what kind of equality. How can we get equality in a Jewish state? And after Oslo Accords, those who belonged or supported the Palestinian National Movement or considered themselves part of the Palestinian National Movement, like me who was in a movement called Abna al-Balad, which advocated uh, one democratic state in all of Palestine. And our slogan was to liberate Palestine from the river to the sea. Uh, and we were considered ourselves part of the PLO and part of the Palestinian Nation Project. And because of that, we really were persecuted massively. I, I myself, several times, arrest, harassment, firing from work, and my colleagues. All the time, I mean, we were persecuted and harassed and even tortured, uh, some of us. Nothing. So after Oslo, and we were shocked, we and other nationalists, we were shocked really because of Oslo. Because Oslo normalized the relation with Israel, with the, with the Zionist movement, excluded us from the religion. We are, we are not mentioned at all. And we were asked to, relate, to behave as Israelis, as internal Israeli affair. So we started to think, how can we create a formula in order to bypass or to, up, to, to intercept this situation? You know, Oslo, in fact, embodied or reflected the acute crisis that the Palestinian National Movement has been undergoing. Oslo was not, I mean, the, the crisis of the Palestinian leadership and the project did not start in Oslo. Oslo was an embodiment of the uh, crisis. And, uh, but that was, we never expected that the PLO would sign an agreement with Israel and recognize it implicitly as a Jewish state. So we thought that we should challenge the Jewish state. If the Palestinian National Movement has conceded on that, because of the imbalance of forces, we should use our citizenship as a source of strength to, come to challenge the, 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 the Israel as a, as a Jewish state. How? We said, okay, we, have never, we had never taken our Israeli citizenship seriously, in fact, because we never believed that equality can be achieved as long as Israel as a Jewish state. We said, okay, because uh, Palestinians today are, are, are united around, around the interim solution, as, uh, which is Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And it's difficult really to challenge the Palestinian consensus and also the international consensus and the Arab con uh, uh, consensus. So we thought that in order not to look adventurous or utopian or childish, so we thought that we should really create something that to lead to the same place, but in a different way, in a sophisticated and modern way. And then we moved, shifted from dogmatic Marxism to liberal democracy. And of course, this I mean, uh, argument uh, started in fact the late 80s, not only after Oslo, but when Oslo was signed, it, uh, it, it, uh, it, it gained a momentum. Uh, a momentum. So, 
And after two years of uh, debating the idea, we came, it's not, an, if we, uh, by the way, it wasn't easy. For me, for, for example, not me only, but I, as an example, who, be, who advocated a one-state solution all of Palestine, and, used to, and we were used to the slogans, liberation of Palestine, and, not, uh, and don't accept the state of Israel. And to say that we want a state, that we want Israel, the state of all citizens, uh, of its citizens. You know, this is not easy for Palestinian nationalists to use these, these, these terms. But despite that, we thought that we can do that because what this will lead to the abolition of the state of Israel as a colonial and Jewish state. I mean, theoretically, I mean. And so because of our unique situation inside the Green Line, and because many, all of the Palestinians are subordinated, are subservient to the Israeli economy, where are we, on our daily life, we, 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 we depend on the state of Israel. I mean, we depend, we work there. We don't have a separate economy. We don't have a, a separate education system. We, and you are a Palestinian who belong to the Palestinian people, which your state is fighting these people. And the state of Israel wants you to be loyal to it and be, and be a part of it. And you know that the state of Israel, as, a, as its policy of divine and rule, separated the Druze community and other people and, uh, uh, and recruited them in the army, and they are in the army. So now, and because also after Oslo, we witnessed, and this was shocking, many people, go to the Zionist parties, to the Labour Party especially, and merits, and leaving the nationalist movement. They thought that it's enough. The Palestinian cause is on, on the way to solution, to its solution, and so we want to be Israelis. We, we can have equality now. It was an illusion. So we have to stop this illusion. You have to tell your people that you will not never get equality if you forego your national identity, if you forego your national, if your collective rights. You have to be Palestinian, to be proud that you are Palestinians. We are not Israelis, because there is no such a thing as Israel nation. To belong to the state of Israel, you have to be a Jew. So this, it's not easy to, to, to convince people that this is not easy. But despite that, we, of course, we had the equation which called national identity, full citizenship. This is our, the two pillars of our, uh, our party, the platform of our party. Full citizenship, national identity, and full citizenship. Full identi uh, national identity that we are part of the Palestinian people, we are part of the Arab nation. Full citizenship that we want to be equal citizen, full equal citizen in the state. And we really reunited all the uh, national groups inside the Green Line and built a new party called the National Democratic Party. So many people were laughing at us that you are not going to succeed in such a grim reality that all the Arab world is, is, is in defeat, is, everything is collapsing, the Soviet Union crumbling. So where are you going? You are going to build a new nationalist, nationalist party while nationalism is disappearing in the Arab world. The Arab world is... So despite that, we challenged because... It's simply because we used the word citizens, full citizenship and we challenged the Jewish character of the state. By the way, just to mention, in 2003, you know how Zionism was because we know that, uh, because some people thought that we are naive to think that Israel will grant us citizen, full citizenship. And we really, and there was a tense debate at the time. Not everybody was convinced of this idea. Some of my colleagues, they wouldn't say this is, they would say this is, you are again becoming Israeli. You would call for a full citizenship, this means that we are going for going our national identity. But I myself thought always, and wrote that, that, that I believe that one day this formula will, be, will come to clash with the Israeli ideology. And you will see. Of course, really the guy who created, mainly who developed this idea is Azbi Bishara, the, lead, the former leader of our party, who is now in exile. And I think that we owe him a lot we learned him from a lot of our dad because he is a philosopher in, in uh, political, in philosophy. He studied in Germany, but he was uh, formerly, originally he was a communist in the Israeli Communist Party and he split from the Communist Party since he was 24, 24 year old. Uh, and 
I, what I wanted to, to point is to an example how the state of Israel looked at our party. You know, two or three years later, they started harassing us, persecuting us, simply because we, 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 because we, we uh, embrace such a demand. In 2003, before the elections, at the eve of the Knesset elections, the uh, prosecutor, Daya Sasson, called Talia Sasson, said that Azmi Bshar, no, before the Shin Bet, the Shabak, Ame Ayalon, the former head of the Shabak, said that Azmi Bshara and his party have crossed the, the red line. They don't recognize that the Jews have the right to an independent state. And they should be tried. In 2003, the Central Election Committee disqualified our party. They don't want us to go to the Knesset. Although, when we decided to go to the Knesset, it was really an agony. Because we didn't believe in the Knesset before. It's not easy to be in the Knesset. Talia Sasson said, explained herself in the court, said that uh, the, policy, the, the bad things in this party is that they don't call for a mere equality, but they call for an absolute equality. And she continues to argue, this means that this party does not recognize the right of the Jews to their own state. This means that you are against the state of Israel, and you should be. But the ruling of the elections committee was overturned. There were seven judges, four by one. You know, they win by one. This means that four judges wanted to ban our party, four judges. But you know, they say that the uh, uh, Supreme Court, the Israeli Supreme Court, is the last bulwark against uh, so and so. But you know that the Supreme Court finally is part of the Zionist system. So we have so far, I mean, now 21 year, years after the establishment of our party, we still pose a threat or a source of worry for the Israelis. At the eve of every election, they disqualify us. And we go to the court and we win. But now, recently, recently, the Minister of Defense has called to ban our party, not to disqualify us, to ban our party. You know they banned the Islamic movement. And, okay, because of the propaganda against Islam in the West, I mean, they did not get enough uh, support. But it would be very not difficult for us to deal with us if we outlaw us. Because we are a democratic party, we embrace universal values, it would be very difficult. But, in, but given the steadily shift to the right in Israel, I mean, we really don't rule out the possibility that they would embark on this crazy uh, step or measure. But anyway, I mean, I think that the Palestinians inside Israel are, are, are strong enough, are strong enough to combat such uh, possible measure. But we need, of course, support inside Israel and outside Israel. And we really think that we are going to face more dangers. Now, with regard to the, our role in this project, the Palestinian National Project, which is declining, and nobody knows what is the Palestinian National Project today. You know, the Palestinians started from one, they wanted to liberate of Palestine, then shifted to an interim state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, and then ended in Oslo, Bantustans. We are now, Israel is controlling all of Palestine. It's controlling us inside the Green Line, controlling Gaza, controlling Jerusalem, controlling uh, uh, the West Bank, and there is no such a thing, green line. The distinction in the treatment is fading. They used, you know, of course, I'm not saying that our situation is worse than the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. I'm not saying that, to be objective. But really, Israel is, has recently, treating us, or again, 
as in the 50s through the prism of security and demography. We are a demographic nature and we are a security nature for them. And once a minister, a minister, some five years ago said that the Arabs in Israel are more dangerous than the, nuclear, the Iranian nuclear bomb. And they are obsessed with the numbers. Every day they count our numbers. Uh, there is an uh, 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 Israeli academic called uh, Sofer, Arnon Sofer. In Hebrew, Arnon Sofer, Sofer, and to count, counting. So every day he counts Arabs. How many Arabs? How many Arabs? They are afraid. So they are obsessed with the Arabs, and, they, and not only that, because with the Arabs, you know, until recently, they would tolerate the demography. But when this demography changed into power, into political power, political dissent, political awareness. Palestinians have become more assertive of their identity and they have raised the ceiling of their demands and they are ready to resist and they are willing to resist and to be part of the Palestinian people. This is what makes them crazy. And also because also the, you know, the Israeli right now is uh, becoming more focused on the Palestinians in Israel because and they felt before Netanyahu retreated from the two-state solution, of course this is a only verbal. Uh, they thought that they lost the uh, battle over the land of Israel and they have to focus on the Palestinians in Israel. Uh, five? Oh, it's okay. Yani, we will, even we have four uh, hours, we will not finish. But anyway, it's okay. Uh, so I think that the Palestinians in Israel have a strategic role. They can play a strategic role. I don't know how exactly, but if I say which party which can really play the unique role in uh, promoting the idea of one democratic state among Palestinians in Israel. It's the democratic party, it's our party. We are the most, I mean, because I'm not saying by the way to be, to be clear, our party uh, does not officially and clearly embrace the one democratic state of Palestine. But we, there is, we, we, the, the, the state of all its citizens, we believe is a way to, towards that, is connected to that. Because when we say that we want full equality, what does that mean? This means that we deconstruct, the, this means that this constructions of the Jewish character of the state, the legal system, theoretically, really, it's one state. And this is really, this is what the Israelis understand that. But, so, now there is a debate within our party in order to change that. We have a conference next month, and we, I'm not sure we are going to change that totally, but we are going to make a step forward to that. But I myself, in fact, am not representing the official party. When I say democratic state, I'm not representing my official, but I'm still debating this within my party. Uh, it's not difficult. I mean, more and more people are getting the idea. And I think this party, when it changes its opinion on this, clearly, I think there will be a really a serious change, an important change in, uh, in, the, in the political behavior of the Palestinians in Israel. Of course, the, the situation there is very complicated. It's not easy. You don't expect, we don't, don't expect that other party, the Communist Party, could accept that. Uh, there is a debate, uh, but there are more and more individuals, academics, activists who are really promoting this idea. And recently, I'm personally I'm involved in different initiatives in the West Bank, outside, uh, in order to find how can we all work together, Palestinians everywhere, to be, I mean, to coordinate our, our, our political work, our logical work with other groups in order to uh, help uh, create a future vision of the Palestinians. Now there is no vision. The Palestinian Authority has no vision. The Palestinian National Project, I don't know what it is. So, but as I said, on the ground, things are changing against the uh, idea of this solution. I'm not saying only that what Israel is doing. No, what also the Palestinians are doing. The grassroots what are doing. The grassroots organizations, individuals, academics uh, who, 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 promote, who try to promote this idea. All this, I can't see it. This is part, this is, uh, uh, in other words, that the Palestinian national project is being built anew from bottom, not top down. 
the consolidation between the two major parties, Hamas and Fatah, it doesn't seem in the horizon. I don't believe that it's going to happen. So this is why that's very important that grassroots organizations, individuals, as academics, activists, work towards this direction. Thanks. If I, can, can I uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. just mm. have a comment then? Mm. It would be odd to, to accept the two-state solution, which it is clear would have settlement in it, with their full military defences and their specialised roads and so on. Yeah. It would be odd to, to think of that, rather than a state of all the inhabitants, where the settlements would no longer be, they would just be towns and villages. Uh, there would be compensation for the people whose lands had been taken by the settlements. But uh, I just find that, that a rather odd point. The second one is, as I was talking earlier, saying earlier, that um, any move towards this kind of new single entity would clearly have to have a lot of built-in aid and structures, sort of government structures, that made sure that there wasn't this second-class citizenship that's why I said it wouldn't be a matter of the day after it started. Everybody would be they're just left on their own with this new status. So, uh, so that's my view of that. What, what would you say? Uh, yeah, this is one of the uh, embarrassing uh, points, really, that to know. Uh, but, uh, but we have to take into account that in the framework of the two-state solution, the major blocks the major settlements blocks are going to be stay there in Palestine. They don't you know, they ignore that. That what you do with this, because already really the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian leadership in general, they already accepted the fact that these major blocks are going to be stay there. So this is all another issue. Second, I, I also this is one of the points I argue with my one of my friends who argue against the idea, who are is in from some degree line. You said, okay, what do, you, do you want to accept the settlers there in Palestine? I told him, you know, they are going to bring all these settlers if there is going to happen. Where? To your village, around my village, your village. And these are very fanatics. So you will have the same problem. So, and if we talk about Palestine, we read, I mean, wherever these people are going to be, I mean, they are going to be a threat until, I mean, the whole system it changes, the atmosphere it changes. But really, this is, I think that this is not, shouldn't be an obstacle, shouldn't be an excuse for advocating one state solution. Because, as you said, the state, the one state or is going to, is going to happen. I mean, I mean even, even despite of us, things on the ground are changing. Yes, I believe in Palerio. I don't believe in Israel. I, I do believe in Palerio. And I like to think that... In what? In what? Palerio, the new name. Ah, ah. Palerio. 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 Oh. Palerio. I like to think, you know, <coughs> the colors of the flag of Palerio. I do feel that... I, I, I like to think that under a secular, transitional authority moving towards the ODS. Many Zionists would rethink, would be able to distance themselves from political Zionism and identify themselves with cultural Zionism, which is after all what Martin Buber and Albert Einstein insisted be the definition of Zionism. They were both of them against political Zionism. And I have a feeling that um, if, if cultural as opposed to political Zionism were asserted powerfully enough, many so-called Orthodox Jews would begin to realize that the establishment, the, geno the genocide in 48 and the establishment of the Zionist political party <coughs> was actually forbidden by Judaism. We have to remember that in the 19th century, uh, late 19th century, Theodore Herzl was excommunicated <coughs> by the rabbi. 
he was excommunicated by the rabbis who knew that the formation of the Jewish state went directly against one of the three sacred oaths of Judaism. Even as late as 1975, the United Council of, Ar of Rabbis in Canada declared Israel an illegitimate entity. And I think that under the guidance of a secular authority, the democratic state of Palaria, I think many Jews would come back from the madness of political Zionism and become cultural, <coughs> cultural Zionists, just in the way that many Palestinians want to be cultural Palestinians inside that new state. I don't know if I've made my point clear, but I very much enjoyed both points and both speakers. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I think that's a very good point. Um, when I was talking about the actually quite small <laughs> proportion of Jews in Israel today who are religiously observant, I think it's that you put your finger on the fact that a larger proportion might actually be perhaps relieved in the new state to know that they were not, their lives were not going to be determined in terms of who they married and where they were buried and so on by Jewish regulations, but they could still have Jewish ceremonies, they could still recognize Jewish feast days and so on. And I, th I think that's a, that's a very good point. And I think the numbers are quite, quite are larger than people realize of Jews in Israel who mm. would rather not have a religiously defined state. How would that, you know, the Getting to the one state, I mean, is not going to happen through persuasion. True. We are not going through persuasion of the Israelis. I mean, we have to work to change the balance of forces. Mm -hmm. We need to, to the power relation to be changed. And I believe the cultural struggle that we are engaged in is very important. That is, at first, you have, as in South Africa, you have to prove to the world that Zionism is illegitimate. Zionism is a colonial and racist movement. Before you, I mean, embark on other uh, plans, I mean, first you, this is very important. You have to delegitimize the colonial project. And this is why it's very important that first, because, you know, there is no war against Israel. Nobody is going to fight Israel. Arab countries are no, and the Palestinians will continue to fight Israelis, you know, uh, politically, you know, the popular level, uh, 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 from time to time, you know, as, they ha as it happens now. But now I think it's very important. This is why Israel is hysterical about the BDS. Because Israel needs its legitimacy. You know, when, when, when uh, Israel puts or places uh, its acceptance of the Palestinian state, of a Palestinian state this bank, on Palestinian recognition of Israel as Jewish state is because they need the legitimacy by the victims. You know, still, they th some people think that it is, they don't need us. No, they still need, they prove that they still need uh, that we give them legitimacy. They will not feel safe. So first we have to delegitimize the work to legitimize totally uh, this entity as it happened in South Africa. But the problem with the Palestinian national movement is that it was, has not been consistent with its goals like the South African National Congress. The South African Congress from 1995, they had the Freedom Charter, and they, they would remain consistent with their goal. One man, one vote. But the Palestinian National Movement went through different stages, and this is what has been very bad. And sometimes, what, what is worse is that some leaders from the Palestinian National Movement, from the PLC Authority, they use the one state solution as a scary tactic, which is bad, because you have to sell, uh, so to sell this idea as a good idea for the Jews, not something to scare them. We have to convince them that this is good one. So, I mean, this is why, I mean, what is going now around the world, the Palestine Solidarity Movement, the BDS, the in in academics who are doing this is very great things. And really, we can, we can, I think it's a close, things are changing. You know, South Africa, until the apartheid, the anti apartheid, the boycott, uh, it took 12 uh, years until it started to yield the fruit. But in Palestine, in five years, I mean, they have uh, achieved um, what, what South Africa achieved in 20 years. So we shouldn't be desperate. We should 
uh, believe in the future, if we have really a, a common vision, if we believe really that we should live together, coexistence, we want to exist with the Israelis. But they want to, they never thought of existing with us. They wanted to, to kick us all because we, for them, were uh, servants to their, to, the, to their requirements. Not like South Africa, ex they wanted the blacks to exploit them, but they wanted us to be out. And this is still really, these ideas are being entertained by them. Okay. Uh, as a proponent of the one state solution myself, I was wondering whether you can comment on how you envisage modifying the international, regional, and national dynamics that propel the two state solution forward in order to leverage more uh, international pub uh, public support for the one state solution. Or do you, whether you consider that not the main point, whether you would consider just the main front to be on the national level. Mm. Well, interestingly, I think I don't think the national, uh, the international community, is committed to the two-state solution in the sense that it, it, it believes that it's by far the best solution. I think it's only committed to that because of a path that has been travelled over 20 years and where the Israelis have made clear they won't have any other solution and they've occasionally pretended to be following the one state. I think if another solution was on the table where there seemed a possibility or a likelihood or a momentum towards a one state solution, I think the international community, if there is such a unified body, would switch straight away. I think they just want a, mm. so a solution and the mm. moment mm. it's clear as it's becoming that the two state solution is dead I think there will be increasing support for the one-state solution. I think America is, a, is obviously an important component about this, and which is why when I was talking about you know, Israel doesn't, won't allow it, the Israel that will allow the, the one-state solution is a different Israel from the one that's there at the moment, as you were talking about, mm -hmm. a change in the balance of power. Mm -hmm. And the moment that Israel comes into being, a slightly different government or a very different government, um, America will be supporting that if it wants a one-state solution. So mm -hmm. I don't think there's a need to... to uh, there's such an allegiance to the two-state solution in the international community that they would fight a one-state solution if it seemed, in the end, the best option. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, even, uh, you know, uh, the Western countries, uh, United States and uh, Britain, uh, at the beginning, uh, for, uh, as for South Africa, uh, they even related to Alson Mandela as a terrorist. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was, who, who expected that South Africa would, uh, would, 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 would uh, apartheid would fall? And I myself asked uh, once, uh, uh, Rolf Meyer. Rolf Meyer, he was, uh, Rolf Meyer, this is uh, uh, the chief negotiator on behalf of the apartheid uh, in South Africa. Uh, he is a friend of mine. And uh, this was eight years ago, I was in South Africa, and for the first time I met him. I asked him the question. He, he was the former minister of police, and also he served for two years as defense minister of the apartheid regime, two years before the, its collapse. But he was the one who was his, his changing his ideas, who, who he, he was, he had started to believe that the apartheid can't uh, uh, exist anymore, but he never expected that would uh, fall in such uh, 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 quickness. And uh, I asked him, really, did you expect that this, the, the, the apartheid regime would fall in 1944? At all, he said, at all. When I, thought that I think that this is a long-term vision. So you note that things, how, how can happen? So we shouldn't, I mean, uh, but but that with regard to the 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 international, yeah, this uh, uh, the international community still adhere to the two-state solution, but it's only verbally. And the what's so-called peace process, which has been undergoing uh, for a long time, uh, was meant to lead nowhere. And uh, Noam Chomsky was the first academic maybe to 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 to, to say that mm -hmm. from the very beginning that he said that this peace process is going to lead, is designed to lead, not because it's accident. He said it is designed to lead nowhere. Correct. And we have wasted 20, 20 years, or 25 years. 
So, I mean, this uh, struggle is a long struggle. We, have, uh, we don't think that this is going to happen soon. This is why we should prepare ourselves. Palestinians, I'm not saying also that it's enough to pressure the international community, but also there should be a combination of popular struggle between international activity and, uh, and, and popular struggle on the ground. This can lead to the fall of the Israeli apartheid colonial regime. You know, I, I really I have been engaged in this debate with some people from Hamas all but in recent years, which uh, I expressed uh, my uh, uh, dissatisfaction with uh, the way they are behaving politically. Because at the beginning, they, th they thought that they thought they believed in Palestine, that Palestine should be liberated and to have an Islamic rule. This is which bad. I never. This is. Uh, uh, outdated, this is, doesn't suit the modern uh, life, and we are against that, that to become, uh, to, to build a khalifa, khalifa in Palestine. But uh, suddenly they changed, like other Palestinian factions, from, from uh, the, the idea of, free, of, of, uh, of uh, liberating Palestine to, to its solution. And they are, okay, with long truce, as they say. But in, in effect, they are... Uh, embracing a one to a term uh, state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. So, and uh, there are very few people within them, they are accepting the one democratic state. And I was surprised that Isama Hamdan even, he is one of their leaders, and he support this idea, but he doesn't say that openly. <laughs> he was in South Africa with uh, us in three weeks ago, we were in a uh, project about that, of uh, uh, initiative. So, uh, I mean, I think uh, this, the, we, 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 uh, people kind of change. Islamic movements, some Islamic movements are changing there. They have become more uh, to, towards civil uh, approach uh, instead of Islamic and religious uh, uh, thinking, and so, so that. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry that you asked me and then I pushed into debt, but I, mean, I, I think the more general point is that mm. just as in Israel there are many different constituencies, among the Palestinians there are as well, and none of this can happen before mm. there begins to be consensus building uh, of the sort that your, your party will get involved with and with bodies in, in Israel will. But I mean, I, I believe that in the end, people will go for the least worst solution rather than for what they have argued for. And you know, there's Hamas, there's Fatah, there's other bodies, there's, there's Mustafa Barouti's lot. I mean, and, and I, I just think there will come a stage where these people do begin to have shared objectives. I think, I think it is important also to differentiate between what people say in private and what people say in public. Um, and I, that's true in Israel as well as in, uh, yeah. as in Palestine. Um, so I, you can take at face, face value what some of these entities say now. I think as the momentum builds, um, these obstacles will be overcome. And, and as Howard says, perhaps more quickly than we realize. I would just, uh, okay, for you that somebody asks questions. Uh, we could. Yeah. Huh? Okay. No, we, well, I think what we, uh, as Palestinians, need now to do, especially those who really are aware of the deep crisis that the Palestinian leadership and the Palestinian projects is facing, uh, or facing, 
And uh, what we need now, as part of a change in the imbalance of forces, we have to go to the original story. We have to go to the 1948. Because Palestinians, the Palestinian problem started from there. Of course, started from before. But I mean in 48, is it a story there? So what, why I'm saying that, and not me, many academics, individuals, they agree on that. I'm saying just repeating what we agree on is that we should go to the story because it's very important that we restore the national liberation values. Uh, the Palestinian project is not clear today. It has been undermined. Uh, the conflict uh, is now uh, has been reduced to a political dispute or border dispute. dispute. And we should uh, invoke the colonial uh, discourse that is to analyze Israel as a colonial entity, as a apartheid colonial entity. So because uh, also uh, under, uh, during the 25 years of negotiations, the terminology, the values changed, people changed. And uh, this is why they uh, accept the two-state solution. So uh, uh, therefore, we, it's very important that we have to uh, bring uh, back the consciousness of the Palestinians of their hysterical rights, that they belong to one people. That, they were, that we are one people, Palestinians inside the Green Line, with Gaza, Jerusalem, West Bank, in the uh, diaspora. So we are one people. You know, even they are not represented by one unified body. The PLO is not representing this the, the PLO and the Palestinian Authority. They are not representing all the Palestinian people who so are facing a problem of representation. Who is representing the Palestinians today? Mm -hmm. Palestine is not a 22%. Palestinian people are not 30% of the Palestinians. So we have to go at least to go back to that we are one. This is, no, because the one, one of the uh, advantages of the one state solution that is a way of reuniting the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. And this is at the source of strength that because you are excluding the Palestinians in Israel. Because day to day they are playing a strategic role. They can play. They are a strategic asset. So this is why we should at least at the beginning to do that. I'm not saying this is in, in, in tandem with all uh, fronts uh, outside in the international arena, a popular uh, struggle. So the culture, the identity is very important. National identity is very important to, uh, to, to preserve and to strengthen and to tell the young generation that you are one people. The young generation is uh, did not lived under uh, with, uh, Oslo uh, period. It didn't, doesn't, he doesn't live the revolutionary uh, uh, era, uh, uh, the ideal, what's the ideal today? We don't have an ideal, we don't have a unified vision, we don't have uh, uh, a credible leadership. So the, the young generation needs an ideal and needs a leadership. The attitude of the international community, which I think is really a euphemism for United States imperialism to Canada about it, uh, and that's really the people who call the shots. I think Britain is just a poodle and, and you know, a non entity. The quartet doesn't really exist, it doesn't function. So when people talk about the international community, they really talk about the United States, and I think people should be honest about that. And just on that respect, although it's not a particularly optimistic scenario, I think we shouldn't forget that. Um, when, well, I mean, on two occasions when you've had extreme right-wing presidents in the United States, you've actually seen the United States doing complete bolt fast on policies and international uh, stances that it's held uh, quite overnight. This was true of Nixon in the case of Vietnam, where he was out of Vietnam uh, in a short space of time when he was one of the most right-wing presidents, and we would have thought he might want to clung on to uh, South Vietnam with a major struggle, which. Uh, dented the credibility of the United States in respect to international uh, perspectives. And the other was, of course, um, the, in, in the case of apartheid, Reagan uh, was actually against uh, supporting the blockade, but Congress voted for it. So he was faced, and again, a right-wing president, was faced with a shift in US policy that went uh, from under him. And of course, that's, in a sense, what the international solidarity movement is trying to do. 
to create those kind of shifts. So I think we shouldn't be too pessimistic, and sometimes these things can happen far faster than you anticipate. But realistically, we're not in that scenario. I don't think it's reached that kind of level of, of crisis. I, 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 you know, as a non palestinian uh, with some modesty, I share much of uh, what Alan has said, um, uh, you know, support that. But <clears throat> I'm cautious about this analogy between the situation in Palestine and Israel and South Africa because the demographic balance of forces, not the demographic, the social balance of forces in terms of the relationship between black South Africans and the white minority ruling class is quite different from the scenario that you find in relation to Palestine and Israel. The white ruling class could not manage without the black workers in the mines, in the, in the docks, in the fields, in the factories and so on. Absolutely they could not. Uh, that's not the scenario, tragically, that we face in this current situation. And uh, as Howard said earlier, actually the, the Israelis would like to lose all of the Palestinians. That would be their, uh, that would be their kind of desire. So the question comes back to this thing that in the struggle of the African National Congress, there were three components. One was the internal resistance, which, uh, as Howard was saying, has in a sense to be reconstructed inside uh, the Palestinian national movement. The other was the, uh, the international solidarity movement, which hopefully you know, is being built in, in, in sympathy and in solidarity with the struggle of the Palestinian people. But the third component was actually the recognition by the white ruling class of South Africa. They couldn't carry on as they had done. And so the question for me, in part, is what do you think are the elements that you can identify about Israeli society that can look at convincing them that they cannot carry on in the way in which they have? Not just from a moral point of view, because a similar argument could be made in relation to the North of Ireland, where you have some, there's some comparison, I think, that can be drawn between the relative privileges of the loyalists as against the uh, uh, Republican nationalist community. And they were only relative privileges, but nevertheless, they clung on to those and still cling on to those to some extent, the exclusivity of work in certain areas in the North of Ireland. So, I, I, you know, it's, it's a <laughs> bit of a disparate set of examples, but I think that there are lessons to be learned in those struggles as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I just pick up on your American point, I think there's kind of good news and bad news. Um, I mean, the bad news is, if you look at a president like Obama, things that he has passionately tried to do, and no, no, no president has been passionate about the Palestinians, but let's, let's suppose that, that a president came in who was. You know, Obama can do nothing about gun control. Obama's had, Obama's had a lot of difficulty with, with the health system. So even if there was a right-wing president, it depends on another combination of things which is to do with the, the two houses of, of Congress. And the problem there is that any member who speaks out uh, during an election campaign against Israel finds the funds have suddenly been found to put up an opponent, maybe a man with or a woman with barely any intellectual capacity at all, but with the money for ads and a campaign uh, to replace anybody who's critical of Israel. Uh, and that, that factor um, is, is what stops a lot of people who might sympathise from making any effort at all towards uh, a, a proper solution. The good news, such as it is, is that both with the success of the BDS campaign and indeed with su some of the Jewish movements in favour of peace um, and helped by the obnoxious behaviour of Netanyahu when he comes to America and um, of APAC and so on. I think, you know, there's a certain amount of, uh, of change in the opinions of Jews in America about supporting Israel. But as, as in terms of America's own political support, um, it's still going to be an uphill struggle, I think, until you know everybody in in that equation believes that there is no solution other than the one state. But do you want to pick up the yeah, yeah. I think an interesting example is the situation in relation to Cuba. So Cuba, which is a country that has been in Florida, who were one of the arbiters of the 
who was the next Democratic president, uh, had candidates in the Republican section of the nomination <coughs> stage, and actually Trump supports Obama on Cuba. And the majority of the, the American population support Obama's position on Cuba. So I, I think yeah. IPAC can be, that could be disconnected if, if as you say, the Palestinian and the uh, anti-Zionist uh, lobby in the American group. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, with regard to the analogy of South Africa, uh, just in short, you know, I'm aware, and I think many who really uh, refer to the uh, South African experience, of the differences beside the similarities. There are similarities, but at the same time, there are dif differences. And uh, it's very essential to realize these differences because you don't have to cope with it, not to deter you from thinking of that or being or uh, because it's still uh, South Africa an, aspir an aspiration uh, for us. Uh, and if you, I'm also always say that we have to, well, some people think about South Africa in a very simplistic way when they compare it to the state of Israel because there are differences. There are big differences, but at the same time, you know, every experience has its own characteristics. But finally, I mean, any regime would fall, would change. Maybe the uh, solution would not be exactly as in South Africa. But I mean, uh, even people in South Africa have such differences. I, I have engaged in, in debate with them. Uh, some of them, even Ralph Meyer, for example, apartheid, who came to Palestine several times. I have met him several times. He believes in one state solution, despite the his awareness of the differences of the two experiences of two regimes. Okay. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm going to take the last two questions together. Yeah, you, you sure? Yeah, just Okay, here we go. Last one. Uh, okay, I just want to comment on one of the things quickly. For the Israeli society, um, some of you mentioned that they're not religious and they um, it's very bad. All the uh, studies and reports uh, that we see from the news and, uh, suggest that they are they have a great hate towards Arabs and towards Palestinians. And this, uh, this, uh, the overwhelming support uh, to Netanyahu for his war in, in, in Gaza, the overwhelming support for assassination in, in West Bank on a daily basis, that all gets a huge support from the Israeli society. So that is a real issue, I see, if, if we were to talk about, about one state solution. The uh, other thing is that uh, I think I think the, I think our problem is as Palestinians is, is really with some people who don't want us to be there. It's not it's not the problem that whether whether we would like to have a, our own state or live together. So maybe at this stage it's far it's far too early to think whether we want uh, we want uh, our own state or uh, or a state shared with the Jews. So. I think it's, it's, it's a matter of trying to, to do like uh, to shift the power here as we, we all talked about it by one thing which is demanding our uh, basic rights as a human being and then what, whatever this leads to is whether to that leads to for, for the Palestinians and Jews to live peacefully together or leads for the separation between the both uh, sort of both people. But for now, I think it, it makes no sense for, for me as a Palestinian to ask whether I want uh, uh, my own state or to, to live in one state solution when the borders in Gaza are closed, when the, the governments are divided, when Israel goes in, uh, in and out whenever they like, whoever they want, leave. You have no rights to anything, basically. And we're asking for a state is, is a little not, not working out in a way. <laughs> Before you this one, we'll get the last question in, mm -hmm. and then you can take them together, that's all right. Uh, hi. Now, my question, I mean, everyone's kind of touched upon this, but I'm going to just hone in on it a bit more. I mean, just start off with to say that, you know, I'm a big uh, supporter of the one state solution, and I agree with everything that has been said today about it. But from my perspective, I see the biggest obstacle to the, 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 the biggest problem that we have right now is Zionism in itself. And in many ways, I see it quite differently from the problem with South Africa, and I think it's harder in, in our case, because the people who believe in Zionism, I mean, they believe it in a way that it's, it's, it's a moral right, um, they see no problem with it. It's 
some, you know, with, like with South Africa, it was useful or there was some kind of benefit, but fundamentally everyone knew deep down that there was something wrong with the system. Mm -hmm. With Zionism, it's more fundamental than that. I mean, Zionism itself is a secular movement, and there's a, there's a lot of you know, colonial and political reasons for it, and those who are not religious believe in that, but they also believe, you know, it's good to have a Jewish state in Palestine, even for non-religious reasons. But, and the religious people, they believe that it's, you know, it's, it's written in, in their religious texts, like this is the promised land, the land of milk and honey, and it, God promises it to you, and you have, and then it goes on, the text, to say that you have the right to, to remove the people who are there, to annihilate them, remove their history, remove everything about them. So but what they're doing there is, is that they're kind of implementing this promise, and they're doing it with this conviction that it's got, it has God's blessing. So when you're dealing with people like that, you know, who, who, who by definition don't want you there, they believe that land is theirs and only theirs. You know, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Because, um, and, and to answer, I think, my own question, I see that the problem is not, and in ways I, I agree with, you know, Gideon Levy says this all the time, that he's given up hope on Israeli society, and he sees a solution as coming from outside, and when the political pressure from, from the international community uh, is, is stronger, uh, pro on state, then Israel will be forced to, to accept it. So I just wanted to see what your thoughts on, you know, how do you actually deal with this problem of Zionism itself when your counterparty has just no way of agreeing with you? If I just give you a quick answer, I haven't the faintest idea. Um, but what I came to talk about was what I felt was the most just and the fairest solution. If we don't agree on that, if we don't put that on the table first, we'll never find, you know, uh, I think we've got too bogged down, and I'm you know, not blaming you for this, I can, I can see why people think that. We get too bogged down in anticipating the obstacles before we've really spelt out the benefits. So all I was here to do was to say, this is what I think is the most just solution, and I have the faintest idea how we get there. Uh, okay, I will uh, respond to, uh, yes, what's the name? What's it? Yes, the general. Yeah, with, the, with regard to, uh, to your uh, uh, question. Listen, the, the Z I think that the one of the major victories of the Zionist movement is Oslo, the, is Oslo Accords because Oslo fragmented the Palestinian people. And we are stuck now in this, in, 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 in this fragmentation. I mean, in, we are, they have fragmented the Palestinian issue into different files. Gaza, uh, Jerusalem, West Bank, Palestine inside the Green Line, in the exile, you know. This is why things are continuing in this way, because we have no strategy. We have no unified strategy. Because we are st stuck even, even the strife in Gaza, what happened between Hamas and Israel is part of the Oslo Accords because they wanted, yani, yani, it's, it's clear that is, is, is as any result of this situation. So if the Palestinians really uh, sit and think that we to, to agree on one strategy, one unified strategy, we will not be able to deal or solve any problem. I mean, because this, uh, the, 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 the problem of Gaza, problem of Jerusalem, or the Green Line. So we need a strategy. When you uh, create and or you, or you, or you formulate an, a strategy, a unified strategy, with, uh, uh, with the means, we have to agree on the means of struggle, on the goals and the common vision. So you, at the same time, of course, you continue to struggle on your daily uh, rights, because for example, in the, uh, inside the Green Line, we talk all the time about our how to unify ourselves. We have documentary visions. We speak all the time about strategies, but at, this time, at the same time, we struggle every day to get our civil rights. We are not neglecting our civil rights, but then some, think, some people think that if we drop our adherence to the Palestinian cause, and they say, you know, there are Palestinians inside the Green Line who are close to the Israeli establishment who wouldn't ask to be involved in the Palestinian cause at all. They think that if we don't speak about the Palestinian cause, we would get our equal rights. This is what they think. But no, we should have a strategy. This is what leads you to your final goal and to your human rights and your political goals. But I also think, if I can just add a final thing, uh, Obviously, your point about uh, Jewish or Israeli racism against Arabs is absolutely valid. Um, but then so was 
you know, the racism a driving force in South Africa. Um, and th these are not necessarily things which are never going to go away or can never be solved. Yeah. By the way, shortly before the fall of the apartheid regime in South Africa, the whites were not less racist. You know, I mean, yeah. it's not because the white, moral, uh, white, white my, uh, majority, or my, my white minority changed. It's because of balance of, uh, because the change of balance of power, because this is why they changed. Okay.